thank you very much for the nice introduction. And uh, I'd like to first thank the Max Bernstein Hill Foundation and IMP for this amazing award. And I'm truly honored to be here talking about my PhD work. So today I'd like to talk about muscle. As we know, muscle is one of the most important tissue in our body. We have skeletal muscle for, uh, responsible for movement. We have cardio muscle for pumping the blood over the body. And we have smooth muscle for digestion, contraction of blood vessel. So in skeletal and cardiac muscles, each muscle cell contains bundles of myofibrils. And each myofibril is segmented into a small contractile unit. And this is called a sarcomere. Here is a typical textbook image of the sarcomere. So as you can see here in different zones, they have different morphologies. And these different morphology is caused by a different arrangement of the two main types of the filament inside the sarcomere. So here is a schematic drawing of the sarcomere. You can find the thin filaments that is mainly made of actin, and there's thick filaments mainly made of myosin. The sliding between these two types of filaments leads to the shortening of the overall length of the sarcomere, which eventually leads to muscle contraction. On the molecular level, the sliding is caused by myosin heads binding to acting on the thin filament, followed by the conformational change within the head that essentially pulls the thin filament towards the center of the sarcomere. Other than actin and myosin, we have a number of other proteins that are all essential for forming this intricate uh, organization. However, what is missing and what we are interested in is the organization of these proteins at a molecular level. So to achieve this, we started from muscle sample from native source. This is in collaboration with Matthias Gotto's lab at King's College London, where they isolated myofibrils directly from mouse skeletal muscle. We then plunge freeze these myofibrils on an electron microscopic grid, as you can see here. So at this stage, the muscle sample cannot be imaged yet because it is simply too thick to be penetrated by an electron beam. What we then use is a technique called focused ion beam milling, or cryofocused ion beam milling, or cryofib milling. And this essentially blasts away most of the myofibril and creates a very thin slice in the center with a thickness about 100 nanometers. And this thin slice, or this lamella, can be transferred into a transmission electron microscope and imaged at a very high magnification. So what we did was to acquire projection images of the same region, but at different orientations. These series of projection images can be computationally reprojected, backprojected to uh, reconstruct a three-dimensional volume. And this approach, this strategy is called electron cryotomography or cryo-ET. With this approach, we now have a three-dimensional image of the sarcomere. And what is very cool about this technique is that the image we have has a very high contrast. So in the raw image, we can see, hopefully, you can appreciate that there are two types of filaments. There's the thin filament, as shown here, and the thick filament next to it. And on the thin filaments, you can see densities bound to the actin filament, which are the myosin heads. And the thick filament, you can see where the my myosin tail originates from. Of course, this is a three-dimensional image, so we can also see from the side. And with this classic ordered hexagonal arrangement of the thick and thin filaments. The beauty of this image is that the high contrast and high resolution of this image allow us to identify directly the individual molecules without any staining, simply by the shape of the protein. For example, we can identify the densities corresponding to all the actins and myosins in the, um, in the region of the sarcomere. By doing that, we can produce a molecular map of this entire region, showing us where the proteins are. So here, the thin filaments are in green. They are all in registry, to our surprise. The thick filaments are not shown here for a better visualization of the myosin head colored in yellow, orange, and magenta. We then analyze the distribution of these myosin heads to see the in-situ in interactions between actin and myosin. So on top, this is a footprint map of myosin heads plotted on a single actin filament. 
Uh, essentially, we found that the binding of, between myosin and actin is simply driven by physical limitations such as distance and orientation. Essentially, it depends on where the thick filament this myosin comes from, it prefers to bind to actin subunit that orients towards this thick filament. Among all the heads we've analyzed, we observed that most myosin heads tend to form this double head conformation, meaning that the two heads from the single myosin molecule, they bind next to each other onto adjacent actin subunits. And while this is the majority of the case, uh, we also see very rare uh, occasions when the two heads of myosin split and bind to two different actin thin filament. Of course, we can explore more than just actin and myosin. For example, we can look into different regions, other regions of the sarcomere, such as the Z-disc. So the Z-disc is the boundary of the sarcomere. So here you find the thin filaments from the upper sarcomere and the lower sarcomere. And these thin filaments are cross-linked by a meshwork formed by a protein called alpha-actinin. So to our surprise, this meshwork is quite irregular. And what we found that the alpha-actinins cross-link the thin filaments at a variable spacings, with the most preferred configuration being a doublet spaced like six nanometers apart, suggesting they also bind to adjacent actin subunit. Now we have a way to look into the sarcomere and uh, investigate the overall architecture of different regions. We would like to take a step further. So we want to see if whether we can investigate any previously unknown proteins, or at least with proteins with unknown structures. And one of the, such mysterious proteins in the muscle field is nebulin. As its name suggested, it's a nebulous protein. <laughs> nebulin is a very special protein in a way that one single molecule can bind the entire thin filament. So it binds from one side to the other side. It is super elongated, and this protein is crucial for skeletal muscle. Actually, the mutation in the gene for nebulin accounts for more than 50% of a skeletal muscle disease called nemaline myopathy. What we know about this protein is that we know this primary sequence, which contains a large number of repeating units. And other than that, previous studies have already shown that um, nebulin can stabilize and uh, stiffen the thin filament. It can also control the length of the thin filament. And in addition to this, it can somehow regulate myosin binding. The question here is how? We don't know the molecular mechanism underlying these functions because of a lack of structures. And it wasn't possible to, uh, to determine the structure of nebulin in vitro because of its flexible nature and it's a super elongated protein. So therefore, we decided to directly look at this protein in situ, so inside the sarcomere. Here is the, again, the three-dimensional image of the sarcomere. And as you can see here, the individual, this is just a zoomed in view of that. So uh, this is, doesn't give us enough uh, resolution to see the, such a small protein. Therefore, we use an approach called subtomical avenging. Essentially, we take subvolumes that contain, that contain identical proteins and then align and average these subvolumes. With sufficient amount of data, this, we can improve this image to a very high, to a structure with a high resolution. And at this resolution, we can then tell apart different components, such as actin, tropomyosin, and a pair of myosin double head. What we notice in this structure is this additional magenta density, elongated magenta density, which we, add, which we propose to be nebulae. But in order to confirm its true identity, we then look into cardiac muscle. The reason is that in cardiac muscle, naturally nebulin is absent. So it's like a natural mutant. And using the same technique, using the same workflow, we were able to obtain the same structure of a thin filament. And in, from the structure in cardiac muscle, there's clearly a lack of the magenta density here, confirming that indeed this is nebulin. So this in-situ structure of nebulin uh, together with actin was resolved to a, a resolution of 4.5 angstrom. And at this resolution, we were able to build a atomic model of this protein, and we can match the sequence with the structure. As I mentioned earlier, nebulin contains a lot of repetitive modules, and each simple repeat of nebulin contains essentially two helices separated by a kink. And there's a loop region connecting 
adjacent repeat. Now we have a structure. We can finally look into the function of this protein and understand the mechanism of how uh, nebulin functions. So first, our structure shows that there is a clear one-to-one -one stoichiometry between the nebulin simple repeat and actin subunit. And this gives nebulin the power to be a molecular ruler in controlling the length of the thin filament. Simply by adjusting the size of this protein, we can have thin filaments of different length. The structure also shows that every nebulin simple repeat forms a series of interactions with its neighboring actin subunits. And these involve um, electrostatic interactions, some hydrogen bonding, and cation pi interactions. These additional interactions provide additional molecular contacts that enable um, nebulin to act as a glue to prevent actin filament from depolymerization. By comparing our structure with the previous structure of another myosin binding regulator protein called troponin, we found that one of the troponin component, troponin T, overlaps with where nebulin is located. And this suggests that nebulin can interact with uh, troponin T at multiple different sites. And this explains how nebulin may regulate myosin binding without direct contact with, uh, with myosin or with tropomyosin. So in the end, with a structure, we can better understand the pathogenicity of the mutations in nebulin gene and help us in early diagnosis. For example, there are two founder mutations for nemaline myopathy that can correspond to a disruption of either the hydrogen bonding between nebulin and actin or a disruption of the first helix in the nebulin structure. So the beauty of in situ structure is that although we are most interested in nebulin, we can also solve the structure of its neighbors, in this case, the myosin doublehead. As I mentioned earlier, they prefer to form this doublehead conformation, which is quite unique and hasn't been identified in an in vitro system. So to cut the story short, the structure of this myosin doublehead show a different conformation uh, in the lever arm region or the neck domain that help a, a myosin molecule to accommodate the simultaneous binding to the thin filament. And adding to this, uh, different conformation, the myosin doublehead also has a variability um, of this overall shape of the uh, lever arm region that improves the uh, adaptability for the formation of cross bridges between the thin and thick filaments. So to summarize, with the workflow of cryofib and cryo-ET, we open a door into the interior of the sarcomere and we can look at the organizations of different proteins um, at molecular level. And to be further on this, we can even zoom into individual components and finally solve structures directly inside their um, native environment without the need of in vitro, purification, uh, in vitro purification. So of course in the future, we can expand this onto different muscle types and muscles of disease states or aged states to give us insights into muscle diseases at molecular level. With this, I would like to thank all the people involved in my project, especially my supervisor, Stefan Ranzer, who has been a great mentor, and my colleague, Michael Grinch, who helped me a lot in data analysis. I would like to thank our collaborators at KCL, uh, Eileen and Matthias, for isolating the muscle sample from mouse. And I'd like to thank all the funding bodies and thank you all for your attention. Thank you.